It's quiet down now that we're about to start the session. It's a little bit rumbly and noisy in here. I'm Jonathan Balcom. I'm an ethologist who recently relocated to Belleville, Ontario, where, well, I grew up in Ontario, but it's been 31 years since I've lived there. So I'm excited to be reacquainting myself with Canadian nature, including the people who are in Quebec. So I'm happy to host tonight's session. And um, rather than make it up as I go along, I'm going to read the very nice introduction that uh, our first presenter, Gary Comstock, gave me. Um, but first, before I do that, I'm going to just uh, tell you this, the basic format that we'll have tonight so you know what to expect. After my introduction, we will have Gary come up and he will give a presentation. And that will be about 45 minutes. And then when he's done, we'll take about 10 minutes of Q&A. And I don't know if this was on the program, but we're very happy to have uh, a local veterinarian, Dr. Jean-Jacques Conneboon, uh, who has a private practice. And I'll introduce him before he speaks after that Q&A session. And then following his presentation, we will have a general Q&A. With a discussant. And the discussant is you. OK, great. Great. Well, I'll let you introduce yourself, because I'm sorry, I, wa I wasn't apprised of that. Or I wasn't aware of it. So let me introduce Dr. Gary Comstock. He is a professor of philosophy at North Carolina State University. Early in his career, he edited a book called Is There a Moral Obligation to Save the Family Farm, which marked his interest in agricultural ethics. He is also the author of Vexing Nature, question mark, on the ethical case against animal, uh, sorry, agricultural biotechnology. He is the co-editor of a book called The Moral Rights of Animals and a co-author of the forthcoming Chimpanzee Rights. Tonight he will be talking about cows and his title in particular is A Cow's <laughs> Concept of Her Future. And I do see that Jean-Jacques Gonneboom is in the program, which is great to see. So please welcome Gary Comstock. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Stefan Harned. I have to say to all of you that have gotten to know Stefan this week that he's my hero. Uh, he's a white male who has used his position of privilege and his uh, reputation and stature in the field uh, to pursue a cause that I believe in. Uh, so my thanks to you for that, but also on behalf of all of us, I wonder if we could give him a hand. Thank you. This cow is, uh, looks like a Holstein to me. It's in a stanchion, and her wide eyes and outstretched neck indicate that she's looking forward to something. Is she? Is she thinking about her future? Can a cow think about her future? The question bears on the three themes of the summer school, how to determine whether another species feels and thinks, how to determine what another species feels and thinks, and what, if anything, to do about it. Let me say a word first about that last question. What we currently do with cattle in North America is kill them at a young age for meat, or if they're good milkers, milk them for a few years and then slaughter them. A common justification for treating cows this way is that the animals don't think about their futures. Most people object to causing animals pain, but have no objection to killing them humanely, that is, swiftly and painlessly. And why do we accept killing animals while objecting to hurting them? Because, we often reason, they act only on instinct and live only in the moment without conscious anticipatory plans. Furthermore, we often think that each animal has a value that's lost when the animal is killed, but that loss is made up and replaced by the next animal that comes into existence. I want to focus tonight on the psychological claim and ask whether it's true that the temporal length of a cow's future is either nothing at all or limited to a very few seconds. The question is important for ethical reasons. If cows consciously think about their future, and if we can show that they do, we will have cleared an important hurdle in the way of establishing a cow's right to life. For according to one widely accepted view, an individual may only have a natural moral right to something if they first have a legitimate interest in it. For example, I have no natural right to the milk produced by those cows because I have no legitimate interest in that milk. To establish such an interest, I'd have to show that I've paid for the milk or bought the cows or in some other way grounded my moral rights claims 
in personal interest claims. On this analysis, to have a natural or a moral right to X requires that you have a legitimate interest in X. To have a right to your future requires that you have a legitimate interest in your future. If a cow can take an interest in her future, she's taken one big step towards satisfying the conditions needed for her to have a right to her future. But if she cannot take an interest in things that have not yet happened, then it will be more difficult to establish a right to life for her. So the questions are important. Now let's go back to the cow in front of her feed trough. I'm gonna call her Betsy. What is Betsy feeling and thinking about her future, if anything? Here are three possibilities. Here comes Jake with our grain. When he gets here, I sure hope he doesn't dump it all in front of Babe like he did yesterday. I know she's his favorite, but that's just not fair. Call that the autobiographical answer. Notice it's in the first person. Here's a second possibility. She's thinking something pretty simple like belief, if tub arrives, feed. Belief, if tub does not arrive, no feed, want feed. Here's a third pause. I'm gonna call that the biographical answer. Notice that it's in the third person. There's no reference to I. Um, but as I will argue, it has a narrative structure. Here's a third possibility. Betsy's mind is blank. She's not thinking or feeling anything. This I'll call the stimulus response answer. Since she lacks language, she can't form any beliefs about the future at all. She acts only, as we're accustomed to saying, on instinct. Which of these three answers is best? I'm gonna argue for the second one, cows have biographical perspective. First, I'd like to define some words that I'm using. These are on your handout in the second paragraph. Perspection, I mean a mental state directed toward events that may come or actions that may be taken. I'm engaged in perspection when I think about whether I'm gonna be done with all these present this presentation in 40 minutes from now, as I've promised to do, or when I think about the future price of Bitcoin. Unconscious perspection is perspection of which one is unaware and to which one cannot attend. I'm engaged in unconscious perspection whenever my autonomic system is making predictions about where my fingers will wind up a few milliseconds from now, whether, whether my proprioceptive equipment is adjusting my neck and head balance without my knowing it. Conscious perspection is perspection of which one is aware or is capable of becoming aware. So I'm engaged in conscious perspection whenever my first order desires and beliefs about the future are under my conscious control. Being under my conscious control is an important concept here. What I mean by it is being influenced by signals coming from my frontal cortex. Conscious impersonal perspection is conscious perspection that doesn't involve me. So I'm engaged in conscious impersonal perspection whenever the contents of my beliefs about the future are not indexed to me. That is, the future of which I'm thinking has no direct connection to my welfare. So uh, I might wonder whether it's going to rain tomorrow in Estonia. That's impersonal, personal perspection. Conscious personal perspection is conscious perspection that does involve me. So I engage in it when I wonder whether I'll be done in 40 minutes. I will. Autobiographical perspection is conscious personal perspection in which a mind reader, you and me, travels mentally through time and foresees oneself or others as characters in a narrative plot with the mind reader as an agent. So I engage in autobiographical perspection whenever I have second order beliefs about my own beliefs concerning the future and when I self-consciously construct a narrative about myself and my future, I don't mean that you write your autobiography, but you're running this mental autobiography in your head. Biographical perspection is just autobiographical perspection without self-consciousness. So it's conscious personal perspective, which a non-mind reading individual, I don't think you can read your own mind unless you can read the minds of others. We can talk about that in Q&A if you'd like. Uh, but the non-mind reading individual doesn't foresee themselves or others as agents and characters and plots, but they have first order desires and beliefs about the means necessary to achieve their desires. So I engage in biographical perspective whenever I exercise conscious control over my desires and beliefs. Observers can construct stories about 
biographical perspective. But the non-mind reader doesn't have that capacity either to produce the story or to understand it. So is Betsy capable of autobiographical perspection? Does she have second order beliefs about her beliefs? Does she self-consciously interpret events to come in terms of narratives she constructs? Or is her mind basically blank? To answer such questions, we have two linked sources of information to consult behavioral and neuroanatomical. To know which neuroanatomical structures might be recruited in cows for prospective purposes, we have to start with behavior. Otherwise, when we look in the brain, we won't know what we're looking for. So cow behaviors. What do cows do? Not much. They love to stand around and stare at nothing in particular. They enjoy chewing their cud and switching their tails, lying down, sleeping, hanging around familiar conspecifics, and avoiding antagonistic confrontations. They love licking anything and everything, and that's pretty much it. Most of the time, they're doing those things that we interpret as bovine contentment, to do nothing and then relax afterwards. They appear to understand patience and composure, writes John Katz, and this might lead us to think the cows aren't actually thinking at all. They're just acting instinctually and habitually. However, as Katz adds, cows haven't been allowed to be smart. Indeed, the hundreds of years of domestication and the pampered conditions in which some cows are raised may mislead us into underestimating their intelligence. For once we begin to look closer, we see that cows can be trained to do many of the things dogs can be trained to do. Cows can be trained to follow, to stay, to press a button to gain entry to a building. They can learn by observation to work a pump handle to extract water from a well. But can they foresee themselves in the future? Can they imagine themselves having attributes or possessions they don't currently possess? Can they plot to get things they desire in ways that are flexible enough to overcome obstacles? Back to Betsy. Since still pictures don't tell us much about the future, let me run the video for half a minute so you can see the events that are to come. Sound. Clack, clack, clack. You're hearing lots of clacking from the stanchions. Clever cow. She unlocks her own stanchion using her horn and then unlocks her neighbor's stall with her tongue. So let me rewind the tape again. Go back to the beginning. This is the moment I want you to focus on. What is she thinking? Is she traveling mentally through time? Is she seeing herself a half minute from now having released her neighbor from her stanchion so she can get to the grain in the tub? Is she saying to herself, in first person form, I know what you're thinking, silly farm boy. You think you can keep this old girl out of the corn, don't you? Just you watch this. We have no behavioral grounds for adopting such an interpretation. To attribute such thoughts to her, we would have to assume that she's conscious of her own thoughts, conscious of her own body, has a theory about the intentions and thoughts of the boy, beliefs about what motivates him, ideas about how he perceives her, and a sense of what justice requires in the barnyard. We don't have any evidence to attribute such thoughts to her. No evidence that she has the capacity for moral agency or the mental facility to construct narrative plots, attribute moods to characters, and understand the significance of place. Autobiographical interpretation is problematically anthropomorphic. The simplicity of bovine behaviors, which I mentioned, and the guidance of Morgan's canon, always to prefer the lowest level satisfactory explanation of an animal's psychological state as possible, make it very difficult to believe that cows take an autobiographical interest in their future. Furthermore, that higher order interpretation, I think, leads us away from what's really important. That is, what the cow's actually doing. 
So one challenge is to avoid anthropomorphism. We are justified in describing cow behaviors using mental state terms like happy, content, and looking forward only when those terms are necessary. We should hesitate before ascribing to animals humans moral con human moral conditions such as virtue, vice, pride, embarrassment, and shame because they require a theory of mind and a sense of justice. But notice that the attitude I'm cautioning against here is not the anthropomorphic challenge that I've defined on your handout. So if you look there, you'll see this attitude. It's impossible to know whether an animal's subjective experience is like our own. We do not and cannot know whether a dog, pig, or cow looks forward to his future in anything like the way we do. That's a different attitude. And I want to uh, say that we have a way to actually answer it. And that is to look at neuroanatomical structures, first that support prospection in humans, and then see whether they're there in cows. For if cows have these neuroanatomical features, it will seem reasonable, more reasonable, to hold that cows value their futures in the same way we sometimes do than not to. Another challenge is to avoid what Kristen Andrews, who was here the first night, I think, of the summer school, calls anthropectomy. That is, failing to ascribe to animals mental states that they, in fact, have. And I'm going to skip the part where I say why I don't think we uh, should attribute the stimulus response interpretation to the animal in the interest of time. So my hypothesis is cows have biographical prospection. What is that? I want to say a little bit about the difference between autobiographical and biographical. Notice first an important similarity that both are narratively constructed. Both consist of a temporal series of events unified by a single individual psychology their memories, emotions, beliefs, and aspirations. An explanation is required to show how these features of an individual's mental life enacted in a series of behaviors extended over time form a coherent account of that individual. Such explanations, according to one influential account, are narrative because they employ three of the main elements of what the Aristotelian poetic tradition calls tragedy, plot, character, and mood. Plot, character, and mood are elements of biographical as well as autobiographical consciousness. The difference between the two forms is not in their structure then, because both tell a story with a beginning, middle, and an end in which at least one agent, the hero, must face some obstacle to be overcome in order for the plot to reach resolution. Biographical consciousness has the same methods and features as autobiographical consciousness. The difference comes in the content and the perspective of the two forms. Autobiogra autobiographies are told in the first person and focus on that person. Biographies are told in the third person and focus on someone else. Do cows act in ways such that we observers can construct narratives telling causal stories that connect temporally discrete moments in the cow's lives with accounts of what they're wanting and feeling? To answer the question, let's first give a more careful analysis of what biographical prospection amounts to. Now in your handout on the first page, this is called Biographical Prospection Analysis. And rather than read through all of it, I think I'll just read through some of it. In biographical prospection, an individual's desires and beliefs are arranged in sets and indexed to certain times in the subject's experience. The following analysis of Betsy's perspective stage is inspired by work of Peter Carruthers. At T1, Betsy possesses three mental states. Belief, feed is in tub. Belief, if tub is reached, eat. Probably another belief, if tub is not reached, don't eat. And a desire to eat. The combination of one, two, and three automatically produces movement at T1, and Betsy stretches her neck toward the tub, just as we saw her. Now, if Betsy could reach the tub, then we could do away with the belief and desire apparatus and substitute a stimulus response explanation. The feed is the stimulus. Betsy's reaching for the tub is the response. End of story. Betsy's mind, in that case, is blank. But Betsy can't reach the tub, and at T2 finds herself with another belief. Belief four, feed is unreachable. And so, bumping up against her stanchion and prevented from reaching her goal by moving toward it, she pauses and rethinks things. Now at T2, she has these additional attitudes. If tub isn't reached, don't eat. Tub can't be reached unless neighbor moves. 
and a desire for the neighbor to move. The neighbor won't move unless this lock is open. Lock won't open unless head is used. Desire for the lock to be open. The combination of 10, 11, and 12 lead Betsy to act against her instinct, to push harder against her stanchion, and instead she backs away from her goal and tries to use her head to open the lock. The combination of another three sets of mental states, which aren't on your handout, uh, lead her two dozen seconds after the first moment to have a new set of beliefs and desires, which contains as a subset the original one through three. The updating continues in an iterative process, repeating itself until she's finally able to reach the tub. Now, why is this analysis not autobiographical? Because nowhere in it do you find the subjective words I or me. You only find objective claims couched in the third person. Why is this analysis narrative? Because it explains a temporal series of desires and beliefs by showing how an individual psychology unifies them. Were the cow simply bellowing at its neighbor and trying to get it to move by issuing threatening vocalizations, we could describe its behavior using just words. Now I'm calling moos, tendentiously, words. Live with it. I think a moo is a word, and they use those words to call their calves to <clears throat> issue antagonistic uh, warnings and so on. We can talk about that in Q&A if you'd like. Point is, the cow's doing more than issuing loud warnings and bellicose bodily gestures. She's engaged in practical reasoning. The fact that we can express her mental states in an if-then form shows her capacity for planning and decision-making. Now, with this as background, what do we know about the neural correlates of desire and belief in humans? Desire is the state of mind of liking, wanting, or seeking something. The satisfaction of a desire is, by definition, pleasurable and it's caused by bodily changes. For example, hunger and thirst are desires, and they're caused by deficiencies of protein or water. The first point I want to emphasize about desire is that it can be wholly unconscious. In very oversimplified terms, the upper part of the brain, the cortex, is where conscious states occur. This is work uh, by Jak Panksepp, the effective, affective neuroscientist, uh, and he describes it as the seeking system. Seeking can occur without the cortex being involved. And we know that consciousness can occur in humans without the cortex uh, working. When presented with a rewarding stimulus, the sight of a mango when you're hungry, the subcortical regions of the brain can initiate action to satisfy the desire. So the seeking system is the basis of unconscious prospection. It's also part of the limbic system or the emotional center of the brain. And this figure is represented as being set in motion by the ventral tegmental area. That's the right green area to the left of the cerebellum inside the pons in the midbrain. The VTA receives a representation of a rewarding stimulus from the eyes or nose, say. And in turn, it sends dopamine across to the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is in the medial forebrain, represented as the green circle on the left. The VTA and nucleus accumbens are connected by the mesolimbic dopamine pathway, which is the top red line. A second branch called the mesocortical pathway extends into the orbitofrontal cortex. Note that this mesocortical pathway is independent of the first pathway. When it's activated, our desires are brought to the attention of the executive systems in the frontal cortex, and we may become conscious of them. This pathway doesn't just receive signals from the VTA, it returns them too. And this enables us to inhibit or modify our desires. But, and this is my main point, the mesolimbic pathway is dissociated from the mesocortical pathway. And so our desires need not be, and often are not, conscious. In fact, we know that electrical stimulation of the mesolimbic pathway, the top one, the subcortical one, causes feelings of pleasure. If I could stimulate it right now, you would feel great. It also stimulates novelty seeking and desire and is a target for people working on depression where we lose those wonderful things. But the orbitofrontal cortex need not be recruited for those purposes. 
Similarly, feelings of fear recruit the amygdala, which is also a subcortical structure of the sympathetic nervous system. And we recognize the face of an enemy in a threatening posture, and we flee without thinking. When quick action is required, the reward system need not consult any higher brain regions to launch us into action. So along these lines, Panksepp claims that the seeking system, like all other basic emotional states, is initially without intrinsic cognitive content. However, if signals are sent up the mesocortical pathway, the bottom one, and returned back to the seeking system, then beliefs may begin to arise. Cognitive content may occur. So what do we know of the belief system? We know it necessarily involves the cortex if this cytoarchitectural story I'm telling you is correct. And by my lights, it's the best one currently on offer about what's going on in the brain. So what do we know about the neural correlates of human executive control? One thing we know is that more complex beliefs take longer to process. Yuri Hassan's lab at Princeton has done this work. They played short stories to undergraduates and mapped the cortical activation. As the task went from simple to complex, the time it took the brain to process the ideas took longer and longer, as you might predict, and involved more and more regions. When the subjects first heard the short story, they heard gibberish because Hassan played it in reverse. So imagine yourself sitting with headphones on and you hear what you're told is a short story that will take 17 minutes, but you can't make head nor uh, whatever the rest of that metaphor is of it. In trying to make sense of incoherent noises, the undergraduate's brains activated anterior parts of the temporal lobe right behind the lateral sulcus. I uh, left out my, brain, my slide that would show you where all of that stuff is, but basically it's uh, uh, right there where it says LS, if you can read it. That's the red part in the picture. So hearing gibberish activates the red parts. When the story was played forward but stopped after a single word, the brains recruited a larger area, the area in yellow, moving backward toward the posterior regions, the hind regions uh, of the superior temporal sulcus. So the sulcus is the part of the brain. If you look at the left-facing brain on the left side of the screen, the, temp superior, the temporal sulcus runs sort of up from the southwest corner to the northeast corner also famously known as the language area of the brain. Broadband's areas are in there. When the segment was a sentence, the brains recruited an even larger area, the area in green, moving further backward still toward the temporal parietal junction. That's uh, the rightmost part in the blow up part of this rectangle here. And when an entire paragraph was played and when the story was played uh, in a coherent manner. Distant parts of the brain were recruited. Expansive areas indicated here in blue. They include long strips of the medial prefrontal cortex way up front and wide swaths of the precuneus in back. Now, we're calling the length of time it takes for the brain to make meaning out of sounds a temporal receptive window. Generally speaking, it takes us about a half a second to process a word, at least three seconds to process a sentence, and at least 17 seconds to process a paragraph. As we move from comprehending a noun to a proposition to a story, our temporal receptive window must expand and the areas of the brain we use must also get larger. Okay, so we've seen some indication of the neuroanatomical structures involved when we engage in biographical prospection. They're the red, yellow, and green areas combined, excluding the blue areas. The blue areas indicate autobiographical processing. Now, what do we know about bovine brains? Very little, and why not? Because in our economy, we have many uses for many parts of the cow, but her brain isn't one of them. So when I talked to George Strain, a professor of neuroscience at uh, LSU, Louisiana State University about this, he said, not many people are interested in bovine neuroanatomy or neurophysiology. You won't have any luck finding neural correlates of desire in cattle because we don't recognize such as being present in animals, or at least have no way to identify to measure it. Uh, Professor Strain's remarks notwithstanding, it's not like we know nothing. So here's a picture of a cow brain. Magnificent work, I think, done by a lab in, the Am in Amsterdam, I believe, showing the medial prefrontal cortex to the left and at the, front, at, at the front anterior end, the cerebellum, big bulb on the right, 
and precuneus are at the posterior, in the back. And there are significant differences between the human and bovine brain, such as the relative sizes and encephalization quotients, and we can talk about those differences in the Q&A. I want to concentrate just on the structures relevant to prospection. Do the cows have homologous structures to ours? Yep. Here's the bovine lateral sulcus, LS the superior temporal sulcus, STS, and the temporoparietal junction, TPJ. There's the precuneus. I'm unaware of any fMRI studies on cows. I'm told that they're pretty hard to get money to do fMRI studies with cows. None have been done to my uh, knowledge, but the preceding analysis allows me to make a couple of predictions. When a cow hears, so this is my slide, those are my marks on there, and they're just made up. When a cow hears an incoherent noise, we may predict that a comparatively small part of its brain will be activated. Perhaps it'll be the area near its lateral sulcus, indicated here in red. On the other hand, when the noise turns into recognizable vocalization of one of its familiars, its calf, a larger region will be recruited. I'll call this somewhat tendentiously the cow's word system and predict that it will be roughly in the red and yellow areas, just as in the human case. If cows can process longer, more complex vocalizations, the areas in green will get involved, namely including anterior regions of the TPJ and the medial prefrontal cortex. Call this the cow's sentence system. I'm not predicting that cows will come to understand human propositions, but I am leaving open the possibility that they may have the capacity to process beliefs and desires expressed in bovine terms that are more complicated than the word system can accommodate. That said, I'm predicting that we will not find the capacity for narrative comprehension in cows. Consequently, you see nothing in blue in the map. So much for bovine belief. What about bovine desire? Recall the relevant structures here are the VTA, the nucleus accumbens, the orbitofrontal cortex, and two dissociable pathways. Oops. So you've seen the slide on the left, that's the human case. Again, uh, the picture of the bovine brain is from the lab in Amsterdam with my markings on it, my predictions. I'm predicting that, uh, so we know that the cows have a nucleus accumbens, a VTA. We know that they have a mesolimbic pathway connecting the VTA and nucleus accumbens. And we know that the two pathways are dissociable. That said, we should be able to predict that the cows have the capacity for unconscious desire. What about conscious seeking and desire? For this capacity, we rely, as you will remember, on the mesocortical pathway. Do we find this in cows? Again, the answer is yes. So we may safely predict that cows have the capacity for executive control over their seeking behaviors. That is, they have the neuroanatomical equipment needed for conscious desire. Let me sum up before moving ahead. We have behavioral and we have neuroanatomical evidence that cows prospect. They look forward. But how do we know that their prospection is conscious? That, I think, is the central question of the summer school but it's difficult to address because we mean so many different things by it. So rather than go into an analysis of consciousness, I want to say that that question is not well formed and we should ask a different question because we'll never answer that one. The one we can answer is, is the cow's prospection like ours? Is the cow's prospection like ours? And I think uh, I will argue that the answer is yes, but we have to look at humans who are like cows, that is non-reporting humans, people who can't tell us whether they're thinking about their future, aphasic, non-reporting humans. Adults who lack autobiographical capacity to understand their lives as a stories and to guide their future behavior based on memories of their own values may lack it because of severe cognitive limitations. These limitations are almost certainly caused by differences in their brain structures and functions. For an example, consider neotenic complex syndrome. Adults with this syndrome cannot construct, follow, or understand their lives as having a narrative arc. This young woman, Brooke Greenberg, 
has profound delays in mental and physical development. She can't speak, read, write, walk without support, feed herself, control her bladder, recognize herself in a mirror, pass false belief tests, or live independently. In this picture taken when she was 16 years old, she had never done any of these things and wouldn't do any of them before she died four years later at age 20. She was capable of recognizing family members. She enjoyed playing with her sisters, rocking in a swing. She took apparent delight in the joy she brought to her mom, teachers, and friends by sliding her walker down the aisle of her special education school building. And I want to show you what's to come in this young woman's life. So in this clip, you'll first meet her grandma and then her teacher, Jewel Adaley. Let's go back to the first frame. At the beginning of the sequence, Brooke is peering down the hallway, preparing to launch herself toward her homeroom. Is she traveling mentally through time, envisioning a future time when she'll have reached a goal? I think this is unlikely, given her cognitive capacities. One of her doctors described her as having the mental capacities of a one-year-old. However, along her way down the hall, she inhibits the urge to give up and collapse in her walker. We see an aide pulling her along at one point, but she doesn't settle for that assistance. Instead, she perseveres on her own. We can easily imagine her encountering a janitor's cart that blocks her path and her responding to the challenge by devising a way around it. As we did with Betsy, we can develop at least three different descriptions of Brooke's mental state at the beginning of the hallway sequence. Here's an autobiographical description. There's my mom, my teacher, and the janitor in front of my homeroom. When I maneuver my way into the classroom, I hope they don't jump up and down in front of the students like they did yesterday. I know they want to cheer me on, but they humiliate me when they make a spectacle of me. I don't think we can attribute those states to her. Here's a second possibility, the biographical interpretation. She's thinking something pretty simple like, if arrive at classroom, feel good. If fail to arrive, feel bad. Desire to feel good. Notice that the biographical answer has a narrative structure, but it's a third, uh, sorry, but, and it's not a stimulus response answer. Brooke's mind is not blank. So I think the second answer is the best one. And I will give you a brief taste of the, I have 10 minutes. Oh, then I can give you more of, I'm reaching, believe it or not, uh, the end. So I'm gonna give you the extended version of the belief desire analysis. At T1, Brooke possesses three mental states, a belief that the target room is at end of hallway, a belief if target room is entered, smiles all around and a desire for smiles all around. The combination of these mental states automatically produces leg-moving behavior at T1, and Brooke propels her walker forward. Now, if this behavior succeeded in Brooke's reaching the room, then we could do away with the belief and desire apparatus and substitute a stimulus response explanation. The end of the hallway is the stimulus, Brooke's walking forward is the response, but Brooke can't reach the room this way. And at T2, she finds herself with another belief the path is blocked, room is unreachable. So bumping up against the janitor's cart and unable to reach her goal, she pauses 
and believes if target room isn't entered, no smiles, target room cannot be entered unless obstacle is negotiated, so there's a desire to negotiate the obstacle, and so on. The causal reasoning found in the chain of these mental states lead Brooke to act against her instinct to push harder against her walker. Instead, she backs away from her goal and tries to twist her walker to avoid the janitor's cart. Succeeding, she turns to the next challenge, turning right into her classroom. Now at T3, a dozen or more seconds after T1, she has a new set of beliefs and desires, which contains as a subset the original set of one through three. The updating continues in an iterative process, repeating itself until she's finally able to reach her room. Brooke Greenberg looks forward to things in her future. And she does so consciously. And she does so without complex linguistic skills. She has biographical perspective. Are we barred in principle from understanding how she feels when she's prospecting? Given the differences between her cognitive capacities and ours, should we throw up our hands and renounce the effort to empathize with her mental states? Should we conclude that we can't understand how she feels? I don't see why we should. The same lesson applies to non-human species, some non-human species. There's no principled reason we can't get inside a cow's head to understand how she feels when she's thinking about her future. My conclusion. We often hear claims such as, it's impossible to know whether a cow looks forward to its future in the same way we do. This anthropomorphic challenge can be met by examining bovine behavior and neuroanatomy and comparing the results to non-reporting human cases. It's not impossible to know whether a human with neotenic complex syndrome really consciously looks forward to her future. Nor is it impossible to imagine how she feels when she's in this prospective state. If we're honest in our understanding of who we are, if we refuse to define human experience by a pre-selected segment of the population or rely on an overly narrow interpretation of who we are, we'll find a variety of kinds of human biographical prospection. Before we give up on trying to get inside the heads of individuals of other species, we should avail ourselves of the opportunity to see the world from all human perspectives. Humans are a varied lot with a diverse range of cognitive capacities. Temple Grandin claims that autism is a kind of way station on the road from animals to humans. We do well to heed her advice. Since some varieties of human prospection mirror some varieties of bovine prospection, it's not unscientific to believe that cows experience their futures in exactly the same way some of us do. What this means for the moral question, how we should treat cows, is a question I'll reserve for another day, but I must note that we've cleared the first hurdle I mentioned at the beginning, showing that cows have a legitimate interest in their future because they can consciously take an interest in it. This doesn't establish that they have a natural right to their future, but it does make a non-starter out of the argument that cows can't have a right to life on the grounds that they only act on instinct. Thank you for that, Gary. Really enjoyed that presentation, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. And we're now going to take 10 minutes. No, I'm being gestured from the back, and I have no idea what two hands mean. Because I was instructed earlier from Stephen to have a 10-minute Q&A after Gary's talk. Has it changed? I'm, I'm open to change. I just need to know what it is. 10 minutes? So we're going to take 10 minutes of Q&A from the audience, and then I will introduce uh, Dr. Kona Boone. So uh, any questions for Gary? And there's two microphones. And while we're waiting for someone to go, I, I want to ask one quick question. Um, back, back to Betsy the cow. What's her backstory, or do we know anything about it? Is this, this is a YouTube video I'm, th I'm thinking, and we don't know anything about what her backstory is. The reason I ask is because it would be a big difference as to whether she'd been trained by someone to unlatch and do all that stuff. And whereas instead of her maybe learning it from looking at it and analyzing it in her head, which would be amazing, or observational learning of perhaps another cow or a human doing it, maybe, or some combination of the above. But I gather we don't know any of that, right? That's 
Okay, that's that's my. It's a YouTube video. Have any of you seen it? A couple of you have seen it, yeah. So we're right to be skeptical about these kinds of things. I did notice when I looked at it carefully for the 20th time that there's an editing cut after she releases the first cow before she goes to the second cow. So maybe something happened there. I don't know. But we ought to make something of this video. If, if the cow was trained to do it, that in itself would be interesting. Yes, and I didn't mean to convey skepticism uh, with my, my question. I, I'm impressed with her doing it regardless of the, the origins of the behavior. Pretty amazing. And there are other videos. I've seen a compilation video of maybe five minutes long of cows unlatching all kinds of gates and doors, turning on, ho on taps and drinking and stuff like that. So that's pretty amazing. Do we have no other questions at the moment? If not, do we? Oh, he looks like we do have one. I always have one. Yay. Uh, please say who you are before you ask the question. OK, Thanks. my name is Christian, uh, Christian Bailey. I'm working in philosophy and animal ethics. I'm sympathetic to your conclusion that animals should have a right. Many animals should have a right, uh, a right to life. And they have an interest in their future and their in continuing their, their existence. But I have not been completely convinced by your argument, though, that you, you argued on the basis of this video, you argued that they, if they, you didn't argue that they really have a concept, a concept of their future in the long term, only like a really on a short, short stretch of time. And I don't think it's really something that would really be opposed to what most people think, like when uh, Jonathan Balcom says that most people think that like fish has a couple of seconds of memory and stuff like that. And, and I wonder if you have any, um, uh, any suggestion for a forward looking, but on the longer term than that. And I would suggest more looking in with interpersonal relationships with their young and with planning with like different kind of seasons and stuff that could happen in the future and more than in this sh kind of short clip that we, I'm not sure that it will convince the septic about something about that she's really looking forward for her, fu uh, for her future so we should not kill her. Uh, thank you, that's a great question. Uh, let me just say first that I don't think there is any evidence for cows thinking about their future life. I don't think there's any evidence for them thinking about something happening 30 minutes from now. Of planning for some, the future? Some, something that can't be described in the belief, desire, folk psychology way that I described this behavior. So what, what are you thinking of? I mean, if, if someone to be convinced that a cow has a right to life has to be persuaded that they have autobiographical prospection. No one's going to be able to persuade them about that. No, my, my argument was not. In fact, I do not think that we need to have future, uh, uh, long-term future, that we have to look uh, really far in the future to have a right to life. Uh, I, I'm not convinced by, by that argument, but you seem to be uh, I just think that if you have a preference, future regarding preference and preference, like just being alive, it should be enough. But you well, see, well, you seem just, to argue. Yeah, that sorry, point. just to interrupt you, but there's a difference between having a desire for something and taking a conscious interest in that something happening. That's the difference between the stimulus response interpretation and the folk psychological explanation. And I just, some of these matters are empirical, right? So when I look at what cows do, I just don't see any evidence of long-term future planning. I don't see that in some humans. This was my point about Brooke Greenberg, and you probably don't have to find people with severe cognitive limitations to see that someone can have a right to life even if they want to die in five minutes. The fact that I want to die in five minutes doesn't give you the right to kill me. So my, my 
view is that this is all that needs to be shown to have a right to a future. Thank you. We have time for one or two more questions, but for those who may not get enough time, no, we don't have time? Okay, we're cutting it short. Save your questions in case they might be an opportunity later during the discussion, thank you. So we're gonna introduce Dr. Jacques, Jean-Jacques 